Superstorm Sandy, one of the uh, larger natu natural disasters to hit the U.S. in quite a while. The, what you may not know, though, is like after the storm, the storm passed, but there was a persistent low cloud cover for days and days and days. The overhead assets, think satellites, couldn't see the ground. We were one of the few platforms out there that was able to get under this cloud deck, collect data, and make it available. So when we're flying, we have a fixed field of view from the cameras, right? And the lower you fly, the smaller an area on the ground you image. The coast is a fractal, and so we're trying to map this fractal object flying straight lines, because all of our mapping was done with pre-planned flight lines. And flying that low with a very small footprint was very inefficient because at the end of each and every one of those straight lines, you have to make a turn. The turns take five to seven minutes each. In this one particular flight, there's about 12 turns. So we spent over an hour making a left turn. That's one hour of the five hour flight. So 20% of the time was just making left turns. We knew there had to be a better way to do this, a more efficient way to do this, so that we could turn data around to the people that needed it much more quickly. So kind of concurrently with this, we'd been getting several requests from FEMA and other agencies who wanted, in addition to our traditional downlooking imagery, oblique imagery, kind of a side look at the coast. Because there are certain situations where you can better estimate the damage by having this off nader view. One example, after Hurricane or Katrina made landfall, in our imagery there were several houses that you could see the roof and there was you know, maybe a few tile or uh, shingles missing. But what you couldn't see was that the entire rest of the structure had been washed away and the top of the house just fell down to the beach. There was no house there to go repair. You couldn't see that in the downlooking imagery. Had we had oblique imagery, it would have been easy to see that the roof was sitting on the beach. So on the left, Hurricane Sandy. On the right, a couple of, about two months ago, using the heads up pilot display that we developed for our airplane. As you can see, we flew the entire coast of Washington State with two turns. We only wasted 12 minutes on that flight, two turns. So how do we, how did we do it? Well, this was the pilot display that we had at the time of Superstorm Sandy. Airplane icon over a line. And so the pilots fly along and try to keep the little plane here lined up on that line. Five hours at a time. Keep the plane on the line. Make a turn, rinse, repeat. The display that we came up with runs on a tablet and shows the pilots the coast, you know, this fractal object that they are trying to map, with some guides to help them position the plane such that it is looking at the beach to take images. So Sandy, three flights, 232 kilometers. A couple months ago, the entire west coast of Florida three flights, over 2,800 kilometers, 10 times the efficiency that we had during Superstorm Sandy, due in large part to not having to make a lot of turns. This is just a small example where we had our regular or our traditional coastal mapping mission where we would fly pre-planned flight lines on the coast, which was co-located at an area that we later imaged using the oblique heads-up pilots display. And here's the, this is in real, well, close to real time. They're both, so as you can see, being able to you know, take those turns out, have the pilots do what pilots do, which is fly, they can move down the coast very efficiently. And then more, this is a video snippet of what the pilots, this is not in real time, we sped this up a little bit. So as the plane's going along, it's getting information from the equipment, which I'll talk about in a little bit, lets the pilots see where they are, what's coming up, 
position the plane to acquire the imagery. And as the title of the talk indicated, all these pieces are built on open source. Whereas the the little plane trying to, where deposits try to keep it in a line, that was a, a commercial proprietary solution. And then, all right, so how does it work? So first, let's start with the really expensive pieces of the, the puzzle. We have airplane, the GPS satellite constellation, which is very, very expensive. A inertial measurement unit records pitch roll and heading. So from the satellites, we can get X, Y, Z. Where is the plane? The IMU can tell us where the plane is pointing in the, in the world. And then combining those two pieces of information, which are, they both come in, the GPS satellite and the IMU signals come into the camera. On using a laptop on board, we can do some real-time development of the imagery, taking it from kind of the proprietary format into a, a JPEG. Take all those pieces of information, combine them, and then geolocate that image on the ground. So in an emergency response scenario, we can process this imagery really, really quickly using a, a cloud solution where it takes about, well, we can process three to four images per second in the cloud to embed the geopositioning information into the image to make available to the public. And at the end, I'll show uh, the viewer that, that that comes into. Did you miss anything on that? So that was the, the really big expensive pieces. And now let's move down to the, the slightly less expensive pieces. The whole pilot's display is running on an, a little Intel NUC computer which connects to the camera with a serial to USB connector to receive the NEMA string, the GPS string coming off of the camera. So the Nook and the tablet that it runs on, the whole package costs about 1 50th the cost of the commercial solution that we had and gives us about 10 times the efficiency. So it's uh, been working pretty well for us. One of the big reasons that it, as we like to put it, it just works is that we built it on open source. Embedded on the Nook, we're running Debian. So you, know, you turn it on, Debian starts, we have all the pieces you know, in a, a bash script. So on, on startup, everything starts running, all the services are ready to go so that the pilots and the operator, they don't have to do anything with the system. They don't need a keyboard, monitor, mouse, anything. They just wait for it to come on, connect the laptop or tablet to the wireless signal, which is running as a wireless access point using host APD. So those are the, the specs of the system. And it can handle running this little web server pretty well. The other part of the problem was though, you know, all this had to run in the airplane. We don't have an internet connection in the airplane. So we had to have base maps. You know, we needed open data to get the base map. So we went to, well, we got the data from the, the USGS via a variety of means to get all the tiles for the US, Puerto Rico, Alaska, and pretty, pretty soon Hawaii. So operator presses the button, Debian starts, connect the tablet, and then kind of the, the software end of it, running kind of behind the scenes, is all open source as well. And kind of, it's in three kind of main pieces which we'll break out and talk about in each one in a little more detail. So anybody familiar with NEMA strings, GPS strings from, yeah, so, Got the, this is what is streaming off of the camera. So the, the first one, that's the pitch roll and, and heading of the camera, or the, where the camera sees itself positioned in, in space. 
second string is the latitude, longitude, altitude for those positions. And then this last one, the Popolpazio, is the, the actual camera, where the camera thinks it is pointing and where it thinks it is and where it's pointing. I got that broken down in a later slide. So. It is not embedded in the frame. It, in no yes, yes. In, in we'll say in, in quote unquote normal operations, that information is written out to a CSV log file, which after the fact we can associate. In the real time mode, those strings are just they're coming out of the position and orientation system on the camera. Just every time the camera fires, it says, all right, this is where I think the camera is. Right. So the piece we started with was GPS daemon, which is basically just gives us the ability to kind of abstract away all the GPS part of it. You know, handling the NEMA strings, you know, connecting to it, it becomes you know, transparent to us. We just need to query the daemon from any of the, the different streams, and it's going to tell us what the NEMA string has told it. So PHP is querying the daemon on a one-second interval. All right, where, where am I? So that gives us the latitude, the longitude of the plane so that we can position the plane on the map. We're also getting from the PR did tag the pitch roll and heading so that we can put the, the polygons on the map. Oh, to, yeah, when you saw the plane swinging up, it's using that information to make the polygons bigger or smaller depending on which way the, the plane is pointing. And then each of these polygons, we're just doing some, some server side stuff in PHP to calculate the footprint on the ground. So at this moment, with the camera that points to the port side, if you click the, clicked the camera, it would image that piece of the coast. All right. So kind of the second piece of the puzzle, which is the image footprints. So GPS daemon, again, is being told to write the data out to a log file using the GPS pipe command, which just queries the GPS daemon and streams the data to um, a log file, which we then use tail to go back through the last thousand records of the, the last thousand records in the NEMA string, because it's coming out at four, four hertz. So four times per second it's getting position information from the camera system. So look back a thousand records, use grep to pull out all the strings with popple posio to get the image location. So in the popple posio string, the pieces that we need to know are camera ID, camera two is looking left, camera one is looking right empty string, and then the other important pieces are the easting northing, it's in a UTM projection, and then omega phi kappa, those are in the mapping plane, the angles of the camera. So this is all being picked up by Python. Python is grabbing those results, writing out an, an a Planet's exterior orientation file, that's the camera manufacturer. So it formats it to look like it's coming from the camera software. The awesome is open source software for image mapping, Radiant Blue. They have a booth right out there. They do ortho rectification of you know, satellite imagery, aircraft imagery, all sorts of imagery. And it's really fast and really robust, and it runs behind all of our image processing stuff for emergency response. We have a file that tells Awesome, all right, this is a 39 megapixel camera with a 60 millimeter focal length and you know, these lens distortions. It then uses those pieces from 
Easty Northern Omega Phi Kappa to make a footprint. This is where the image is in the real world. The, that information is then using the SQLite you know, in Python is sending it to into a SQLite database. So every time we get a string of images come in, process the footprints, load it into SQLite database, into the database. And then the pilots or the operator, if they want to see what footprints have been collected, they can click show coverage. When that happens, GeoPHP goes to the SQLite database, pulls out all the footprints as a GeoJSON object, and puts them onto the map. Voila, you can now see what you have imaged, which if you go back to the uh, proprietary solution, it's just a red frame that who knows where in the world it is, but anyway. So, how does the map work? Well, the very, very back end is Mapbox GL. So, using GL gives us the ability to turn the map so that the plane is always look is always up, so that the plane looks to the pilots like it looks to them looking out the front of the airplane. The nose is in front of them also gives us the ability to bring in vector tiles. And so we can get roads layers, other layers, and then you know, put them into vector tiles, which then becomes a very efficient means to serve data out from tile server. Anybody familiar with tile server? Anyway, so we you know, have these pre-rendered tiles, we have the pre-rendered vector tiles and tile server can serve them to the tablet. It also allows us to serve the data and the base maps to quantum GIS. So the operator sitting in the back of the aircraft can monitor the progress of what needs to be imaged and what has been imaged. So quantum GIS can connect to a protocol, so it's just listening to the GeoPHP to get updates on the GeoJSON string that shows the footprints and the position of the aircraft. The operator can also, on the fly, annotate areas on the map that have been missed, save those as a GeoJSON, and then send those back to the heads-up display, and it'll appear in the map for the pilot. So. If they're going you know, around a you know, like Cape Hatteras or Cape Lookout, one of the big capes, they have to make a turn and come back, and they miss a little bit of the island, the operator can go in, notate it, say, hey, I'm sending an update, you need to go back and pick up, then that'll appear in the map. And I've got, I'll show that interface in like just the second. So, one of the big parts of it, as I, I kind of mentioned, was that since it is running in the airplane, it was really nice to be able to go somewhere and get data for everywhere. It might not always be the highest resolution or the most up-to-date coming from the USGS, but it is available for everywhere. And then using the Mapbox GL, we can have the map Again, rotating in any direction. Here it is basically south up, but you know, all the labels are correctly rotated. So as the pilots are moving along, they don't have to crane their neck to try and figure out what the road's names or, or what the road name is, because the road's labels are rotating as the map rotates. If you were to you know, pre-render tiles, they would be looking at the airplane, all right, which road is that, and flip the, the map back and forth, which when you turn the tablet, the map's going to rotate, so the road names are still going to be wrong. Back to the operator, being able to annotate on the quantum GIS map and then upload to the pilot display, we just wrote 
a really, really simple you know, admin page in PHP so that you can add and remove AOIs. They have to be GeoJSON. And then upload those to the pilot's display server. And as just a, to ch check the data to make sure that it is valid before it goes up, we just have it pop up in a map in the browser so that the operator can make sure that what they annotated in Quantum GIS is what is going to be going up to the pilots. And so here it is actually being used in the airplane. This is yeah, the Nexus 9 tablet they have in the airplane. Again, it's connecting wireless to the heads-up display server, which the the commercial solution that we had had a is wired, so you have to run a cable you know, back to the um, the camera. And if you need a longer cable, that can be be expensive. But or if you step on it and pull it out of the camera, that's also expensive. This is you know, looking out of the airplane, and if you look at this area right here, this is a little bit north of Corpus Christi down in Texas, but that is this feature on the heads up display. So you know, as the pilots are coming up on it, they are getting that representation on the heads up display in the airplane. This is the operator in the back who is tracking He's looking at the just the web view on his laptop in, in the back, but he could also have Quantum GIS up tracking it in there. Have a view of Rebecca flying the plane. And then this is kind of the end product. You know, after we go out and fly, we collect these obliques. And we make them available in a, a leaflet map. We have the same software that was calculating the footprints in the airplane we used to calculate the footprints to populate the map. So users can click on the, the image footprint and get the oblique image in the right pane with coordinates in the mouse over. And so it's like, yeah, coordinates on a map, but you gotta remember this image, if you look at this browser, is looking out the left part of the window you're seeing it in the right pane as it is, as it was taken from the aircraft. And we embed the coordinates into the image and then return those on mouse over. So first responders can go to the map, put the coordinates on, or put the cursor on an object that is important to them, like a missing bridge or missing road, and get the coordinates and also the US National Grid coordinates, which is what they all use for doing response. And then, also makes really nice PowerPoint slides when you can take several of the frames and stitch them together in something like Huggin. And that's the, um, the Golden Gate Bridge as imaged from whoop, this flight. And this is the actual flight where they took those images of the Golden Gate Bridge. I have left about 10 minutes for questions and comments. If anybody has any. Yes. That's correct. The question was, what happens before the mission to go out and fly? Well, Actually, all the work is done up front. We have to have the base maps that are going to be needed for that flight preloaded. So in one way, that is a drawback because you can't go to a brand new area. But with, with, with using the NAEP data, Blue Marble, and other open sources, we've pretty much been able to populate any area of operation that we're going to be going to, with the exception of Hawaii, which will 
I don't think that's on the front burner right now, but we will be getting it. So, yeah, basically it all has to be preloaded, but we're in a pretty good space with that right now because we've got the entire you know, U.S., Puerto Rico, and Alaska already already preloaded. So. Well, they want to go to the North Slope, so we we got maps for the whole state. So if they get up there and it's ice free and they can image the coast, they'll be out there doing it. But yes. The, what was the primary driver for moving away from the COTS solution? The, it was you know, Hurricane Sandy and watching you know, this really slow process of trying to image the coast with straight lines. And that's the, at, they have updated some stuff since then, but at the time, the only option they had for flight lines was pre-planned straight lines. Another part of that is, so let's say you get up in, into the air. You've made all your flight plans for 5,500 feet. You get up there and there's a cloud deck at 4,000 feet. You have to replan all the flight lines. So, and you can tell when that's happening by tracking the plane because you'll see them out over the water doing this. And that's with the operator back there in the laptop trying to replan all these, these straight lines. And that actually happened to us on a couple of those flights. They had to drop down after they had launched, and that is a really time-consuming process. So the combination of that and wanting a more oblique view you know, led us to build this display. Yeah, for like our regular, you know, regular mapping projects, they still use the commercial software because they, they plan all the projects based on these lines. They can tell which lines have been flown, which lines need to be reflown. This was built more so that the pilots could go out and very quickly image a stretch of, of coast. Yes. Well, it's actually both. It is the image as taken, but it also has embedded GCPs. And so it's in the original you know, unrectified geometry, but if you drop it into quantum GIS with the VRT file, it'll warp it into its map space using, right now we've got an eight by eight grid of GCPs embedded into the image, which that is an awesome calc can calculate a course grid. And so that comes out at, I think, 256 by 256. So we pare that down and embed the, the GCPs. We have an ortho rectified product. Mm -hmm. yeah, this, like these. Yeah, so if you were to take this image and drag it into a GIS, it would fill up that space in the polygon in the real world. And one caveat with that, the, the rapid product will work really well in areas with, without a lot of relief. It was designed to work on hurricane impacted areas, which are generally the Gulf and East Coast. On the West Coast, where there's a lot of relief right at the coast, it doesn't work quite as well, but we can go back and we'll probably be going back and re-ortho rectifying all that data to a full, right, a full ortho rectification product. Still through awesome. Still through awesome, right? That, that's all of our back-end image processing for emergency responses is awesome. So one. So the, the, the question was, how long, how much time did we save by doing it this way? And that is, like, one of the questions we wanted, we wanted, to, we wanted to have that slide up here. Here's how long it would take to do with pre-planned flight lines. And so I went to the folks that do our, our planning, 
and I sat down and I told them, like, now here's, here's the slide I want, you know, pre, how, how long would it take to fly these lines? And the guy looked at me and said, well, you know, it would take us longer to make those flight plans than it took you to fly the whole West Coast. I mean, that was 15 hours of flight time to cover the entire West Coast. It would have taken, taken them longer than that just to draw all those little straight lines up the coast. So it's a phenomenal savings in time. Well, looks like that's it. And again, thank you very much for coming out.